Good morning. Nice to see everyone here uh, with Plainfield Fest. It's always uh, a little bit of a challenge to get here. But welcome everyone here and everyone who is viewing via the internet in one form or another. Please take time to uh, complete the communication and prayer form in your bulletin and put it in the box in the narthex. You're welcome to make use of the family worship room, which is just in, outside the sanctuary in the West Wing. Uh, announcements, uh, men, next, next men's breakfast will be August 20th, as usual, at 10 o'clock at Southern Bells. Uh, don't forget the Bible class meeting here at 9.30 on Sundays and 7 on Tuesdays. Uh, it's your, now at the Beagles during cruise night, right? The Tuesday night class. Family prayer, 6.30, third Thursday. Virtual communion, first Sunday at 7 via Facebook. Also, time to sign up for Church in the Woods uh, at the Joneses. August 21st, the sign up is in the East Room, so everyone please be sure to do that. Are there any announcements? Anyone else have an announcement? Our Sunday school class next Sunday will be completing the study on parables and then we are going back to the Old Testament and completing, it's going to be studying some of the kings and just walking through the Old Testament all the way to the end. It's probably going to take us a good year to get through this, but I've started writing the lesson and, uh, and got uh, some of them done. So if you'd like to join us, please let me know so I can print you a lesson. And... Uh, or if you want to, don't want to come on Sundays, we would prefer you to come on Sundays. But to the talk that we have and the discussion is amazing and what we discuss in the scriptures and what everybody discerns in what they're learning. And we just thank for uh, all of the knowledge that the Bible gives us and that it's going to be an interesting study. It's going to be a lot of reading but uh, and how the Old Testament connects us with the New Testament. So come and join us. Anyone else? Any other announcement? Seeing none, then I'll proceed to read the scripture. Today's scripture comes from Psalm 126, verses 1 through 6. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I actually do have an extra announcement that I could have made earlier, but we, I, will be starting a men's discipleship class in September, and we will be meeting as far as I know at this point uh, until I get some feedback from some of you. We will be meeting Wednesday evening at 6.30 here, uh, and we will, the first meeting will just be one of getting together and knowing each other and loving each other and caring about each other and finding out what direction we're going to go. But it will be a men's only. Ladies, I'm sorry, but it will be a men's only Bible study and discipleship class. So if you have a desire to come, uh, discussion will be open. There will be no subject that is taboo. And we will try to walk the walk of faith during that time. And it doesn't bring a friend, uh, bring an enemy, uh, bring your neighbor, or whichever the case may be. But uh, please come, men, and uh, it's open to all. Let's take a moment and pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, <clears throat> 
I ask God that you would enlighten us by your word today. Help us, Father, to experience you in a brand new and open way. And Father, we pray that you would give us the peace that passes understanding. And Father, that as we gather here today, you would speak to us and I will step aside. So Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be ministering and God, that we will be receiving. Father, we pray for your hand upon all those today who need your great and awesome touch. We pray this for your glory and honor and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. If you can, would you please stand with me? We're going to sing page 441, Softly and Tenderly. Prayer time, a time of uh, wonder and amazement, and a time for us to uh, pray together uh, for the needs of the congregation. Hopefully you've put your needs on a uh, prayer request form and dropped them in the prayer box, and if not, we'll take your requests now. Does anybody have prayer requests today? John? Any others? Okay. Well, let's go to prayer then. Father, we want to thank you today for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, above all things. The gift of our salvation through his sacrificial death upon the cross for us. In our place, for our sin, he suffered and died. And God, not only did he suffer and die, he was buried. And on the third day, 
Hallelujah, glory to your holy name. He rose from the grave. And God, we thank you that not only did he die for our sins, but he rose to prove the empty tomb. Father, we lift up to you John's daughter. She's in pain, six months of pregnancy. We pray, Father, that you would be touching her. And Father, all the things that run through her mind and worry, God, we give it to you and ask God that you touch her. And Father, that the pain would cease and desist and the balance of this pregnancy would go without incident and without pain. Until the time of delivery, of course, Father. But we know that there's purpose even for that. So as we pray together today, we pray, Father, only one thing, your will be done in our service here today, that you receive honor and glory, that you be uplifted and glorified. And God, we thank you for this day and hour that we have to be together. And we thank you for all those that have visited us here today, whether they be our members, whether they be our members in the family of God, or they just be friends of faith and friends of yours. We give you praise and glory. Father, I thank you for Kathy and her willingness to bring the folks from Harbor Chase. And I thank you for Harbor Chase, Father. I thank you for the opportunity that you give us to minister there in the mighty and holy name of Jesus. So, Father, these things we ask, be glorified, O Lord. And all God's children said, amen. If you would, please turn with me to page 295. And we will be singing verses 1 and 3. Is that correct? Hallelujah! <laughs> Well, I have to tell you a secret today. I have three messages to preach, but I'm going to do the one that's in the bulletin. So, our scripture comes in two parts. One, Joyce read this morning, Psalm chapter 100, and uh, I believe it is Psalm 126 verses 1 through 6. And the foundation scripture comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 through 15 and verse 18. I'm not going to bore you with reading it. I'm going to tell you the story. The story is that there were three visitors came to Abraham by night. And they sat outside his door, and Abraham saw them, and he went and got the fatted calf and had the servant fix it. He got... Sarah to make him a cake. I, I imagine it was a sheet cake with uh, buttercream icing, and it said, welcome strangers into my house. That's not really what happened, but that just makes the story a little cuter. But he did all of this in, in the fact that he knew these were visitors from God. And they told him all the wonderful things that make hearing from God, wonderful, until it got to the end of the story, and he says, we're going to be back here in a little while, and your wife, Sarah, is going to have a baby. She was already 99 years old, 98 years old. She had a baby when she was 99. And Abraham kind of choked on that, but he was okay, but behind the curtain or behind the doorway, they didn't have doors like we have today, 
But behind the door, she, she stood there and went. <laughs> now, if I were to tell any of you ladies here today that you were going to have a baby in a year and a half, what would you do? You would laugh, wouldn't you? That's exactly what Sarah did. And so this whole story has to do with that particular word, laughter. Um, I, want to, I want to start this message with a few little quotes that I found this morning as I was finishing this up. Just asking. A father was reading the Bible to his young son. Dad read, God told Lot to take his wife and flee the city. But Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Wow, said the son. With excitement, Dad, what happened to the flea? That's a preacher's joke. I've got a, I've got a statement for you. What's the best thing you can do when it rains? I'm going to give you the answer. Let it rain. Unless you think you're a shaman of some kind, you can go out and do an anti-rain dance. There were times at the track I did a rain dance, and guess what it did? Nothing. It was hot and still sunny. I wanted to go home early, so I'm out there doing a rain dance. <laughs> and everybody looked at me like I was crazy, and apparently I was. Even if there's nothing to laugh at, laugh on credit. I'll let that one sink in a little bit. It may take a while. Giggle is God's grace in motion. Have you ever giggled at something? <laughs> Giggle is God's grace in motion. There are a lot of words that can be used to describe God. Creator, omnipotent, all-powerful, Lord, loving, present, all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipresent, all-seeing, omniscient, ruler, amazing, victorious, wonderful, and the list goes on and on and on. How many of you have got other words you could put in there for God? I do. But anyway, uh, many of them come from our understanding of God. Wow. Many of, of the words that we describe God with come from our understanding. And our understanding is how we live, how we have been taught, and how we experience God. Well, it also comes from ex experiencing the scripture. And yet, with an immense vocabulary and wealth of resources, there's one word that we don't talk about. We don't say that God is funny. Now, don't throw anything at me and don't think I'm being sacrilegious. But if you don't think God's funny, let's look at some of his creation. We've got the aardvark. We've got the anteater. And we go from that to the beautiful flowers. These are silk, and I know that, but aren't they pretty anyway? Aren't the flowers that are outside blooming anyway? And you look at the aardvark and you say, God, what were you thinking? In the book of Ecclesiastes, he says he makes everything beautiful in his time. Even the aardvark's beautiful. How many of you remember the story about the hunchback of Notre Dame? Even he was beautiful in God's sight. How many of you looked in the mirror to, lately and thought, God has a sense of humor every day? I look at that and I think, oh, wow. We often include uh, in our list the acclamations of God, but we very rarely say that we think God is funny. If such an adjective strikes you odd, you're probably asking, does God really have a sense of humor? Hi, I'm your pastor. My wife, the reason I'm, I'm not doing number four in the Nehemiah series is because Stella said she thought it was a little heavy for y'all. And it is a heavy message in a heavy four-part series five-part series, and I've got two that I'll finish up eventually, okay? But I want you to understand, does God really have a sense of humor? Yes, he does. You see, 
What I want you to see, repeatedly, Scripture tells us about who God sends and about a God who sends people out with shouts of joy and jubilation. To be filled with joy must mean there's also a brightness and a lightheartedness to God. Why would he want you going out with joy? Why would he want you to read the scripture that says a joyful heart is like a, is good for, a, laughter is good for the heart like, like a medicine? Can you imagine if we laughed more, we'd be sick less? Look at Mary, she's just bubbling over laughing there. That's a good thing. I don't want you to get upset at me. I want you to understand that God has, he has a sense of humor. You see, the thing that I want you to understand here too is that given the immense playfulness of the works of God's hand, I would argue that he has a funny bone or two. Look at the flowers. They're beautiful, aren't they? But some of them, as beautiful as they are, are not good for us, are they? It's like the, uh, the peyote button. I don't know if you know about the mushrooms or not, but it's a beautiful little thing. I don't know if you've ever seen them in the wild, but they're beautiful. But if you take them and dry them and eat them up and chew them and smoke them and all them kind of things, you understand God has a real sense of humor. But he didn't tell us to use that, did he? You see, given God's interaction with people throughout biblical narrative, I would argue that God must have a good sense of humor to put up with the ridiculousness that we, mankind, have brought upon ourselves. Look at all the modern, modern marvels we have. What are some of the modern marvels? Well, we have the internet, we have YouTube, Facebook, we have all the wonderful things. We have cell phones. You know, the greatest uh, wireless communication is prayer. God invented wireless communication, but we decided we had to invent it. I don't know if you ever heard the story. You know, a guy in France dug up, you know, some wire, and he says, I perceived that 100 years ago we had uh, telephones. And another guy dug up some wire 100 foot deeper than that and said, oh, I perceived that 200 years ago we had telephone. And another guy dug down 300 feet and found no wires at all. And he said, we had wireless communication before you all had telephones. Now, how ridiculous can man get? I won't tell you, but it's really sublime. You see, our text in Genesis is a perfect example following the beautiful display of hospitality. This is what Abraham did. He killed the calf. He had the, the cake made. He did all the wonderful things that, that you would do as a, a person hosting some stranger to your house, feeding them, washing their feet, taking care of their needs, making sure they had everything they need. And then, and then they gave him a prophetic utterance. And they said, Mary. Sarah is going to have a baby. Now, I don't know if you know the whole story, but Sarah laughed, and then God showed up on the scene and said this, why did your wife laugh? My wife laughed. Sarah, why did you laugh? I didn't laugh. And God said, yes, she did. Now, was he, was he berating her for laughing? No, but I think what he was doing is he was saying to her, all things with God are possible. 99-year-old lady, hey, Jan. <laughs> Poor Kay. <laughs> I'm trilingual. Un poco tito Spanish, English, and I speak Southern. Y'all, and all y'all better understand. No, I'm just teasing. But you see, the only thing to do when hearing such an outlandish prophecy, can you imagine listening to this thing and you hear God say to your husband, ladies, she's going to have a baby when she's 99 years old. The only thing to do is laugh at that. Now, I realize this may be something that you're kind of trying to figure out where I'm going with. But that's, that's what we do when we hear these outlandish things. 
Of course, that's what Sarah does. And God enters the scene to confirm this news from the messengers. He didn't come to berate her. He came to confirm with her. Hmm. And he calls attention to this response. After all, is anything too wonderful or too hard for God to do? How many of you, when I say something that God is funny, you kind of get a little queasy feeling and said he shouldn't be saying that about God? You know, the problem with the church today is we've got God put in a little bitty box and we say he only can do these things. Well, let me tell you what, God's never been able to be put in a box. God's never been able to be told what to do and how to do it, even though we think we can do those things. But you see, this is the thing. Is anything too amazing or wonderful or hard for God to do? No. God reminds Abraham and Sarah that with God, even the impossible is possible. Is that not an amazing statement? Even the impossible is impossible. When we face bad diagnosis, when we face bad news, when the stock market goes into dumpers and you lose $10,000 overnight, you get frustrated and mad and you just scream and holler, I can't do this anymore! And God says, I'm in control, not you. He'll take care. Why will he take care? Because he loves you. Because he cares for you. You see, the thing of it is, but God has heard the laugh and would not let it slide. And he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. I'll bet you there isn't one of us sitting in here that hasn't laughed about something God's done someplace along the line. But rather recognizing that sometimes the mysterious works of God go beyond comprehension and that we have nothing left to do but to muse in ourselves or laugh. You see, and with that, in the holy presence of God, I can imagine that he laughs with us. Not so much as ha ha ha, but as a pat on the back or a tap on the shoulder or a little pat on the head to say, you're going to get through this with me. We're going to make it together. Just go with me. Experience. You see, and I can hear him saying in his mind to us, oh, if you only knew what I knew. Oh, if you could only see what I see. And you know why God doesn't let us see what he sees and why he doesn't let us know what he knows? Because then we would be so frustrated that we're not where we, we want to be or where he said we're going to be or all those kind of things. It takes a process to get where God wants us to be. You see, it's so beyond our comprehension that the only thing left to do is laugh. Laughter has the power to move our lives, to move our lives forward, or we sit in, in derision in our own self and we cry in our own beer or we cry because we don't understand God's method. You see, imagine this. In the story of Sarah, it is laughter that paves the way to Isaac. Can you imagine the father of Isaac is Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, the children of Israel. Just from one seed, from Abraham and Sarah. Not an immaculate conception, but a miracle of conception. Is anything too hard for God? You see, I wonder if the same could be said about the Easter story. Think with me for a moment, will you? Here, Saturday evening, the disciples are in hiding, crying, anticipating 
the worst to come. And Mary and the women go to the tomb. And they see the open tomb. And they see no body. And they start home. Crying. Disturbed. That the body of Jesus is missing. And they hear the angels say to them, He is not here. He is risen. Not they've taken his body. Not they stole it. Not someone came and got it earlier. He is risen. And I can see them running everything Jesus said because the men aren't going to do this. The men are going to have to come and see. But these women run, run back all the things that Jesus said in three days. They'll destroy this temple, and then in three days I'll raise it up. They said, he said, they'll destroy this temple, but in three days I'll raise it up. And they looked at this massive temple made of, of cedar and gold and pillars of, of ivory and all the wonderful things that are in the temple, and they said, how can it be destroyed and you, a carpenter, raise this back up in three days. You're a lunatic. And I could imagine them guys laughing at Jesus, can't you? <laughs> You're going to do what? But in three days. We sing the song every Easter. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for its foes. Up from the grave he arose. And now I can imagine the women on their way back to the men kind of giggling among themselves. He's risen. He's alive. He's risen. He's alive. He's risen. He's alive. And they get to the men. They knock on the door. They go in and they said, he is not in the tomb. He's risen. He's alive. And the men went, yeah, right. Tried to put him to shame. So here goes Peter and John running to the temple. And they get there and they look in. And sure enough, he's gone. But do you remember what the angel said to Mary? Go tell my disciples. Go tell his disciples that he is risen. And they said, oh, and he says, oh, but be sure to tell Peter. Why be sure to tell Peter? He's the one that stood up in front of all the people and said, I will not deny you. I will stand up and declare you to my death. A little 12-year-old girl looked at him and said, surely you're one of them. I can tell by the way you talk. He said, I don't know him. I don't think Peter was laughing at that point, do you? I think he was crying. But I think Mary and the women that came from the tomb are laughing and saying, Peter, you ain't got nothing to worry about. He told us to tell you specifically that he rose from the dead. Here we are, back at Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> yeah, right. We saw him crucified. We saw him in the tomb. We saw the life leave his body. We saw him go li lifeless. We saw the spear in his side and the water and the blood come out. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, what are you guys eating or chewing or smoking or whatever you do? I wonder what broke the women's silence. What broke the men's silence that were walking on the road to Emmaus? I think after Jesus expressed all the things that he did and disappeared out of their house, they said, I think that was Jesus. I believe that was him. And I could see just a little bit of giggle and laughter come up in him. He is alive. He is alive. I see him. He is alive. You see? Laughter, then, has this thing that makes us overcome fear. Have you ever been in a real fearful situation? I remember one night we went to Chicago to go to a revival, and it was right on the edge of Robert Taylor and Cabrini Green. And uh, we got there, and there was no place to park. Praise God, glory to God. We, we didn't have a place to park, so we turned around and came home. 
And the pastor who invited us there called me the next day and says, uh, we missed you. I said, well, there wasn't a place to park. He says, we had a special place for you around behind the church. Oh, yeah, sure. That's exactly where we wanted to park. I wanted to park under the street light. I wanted to park in front of the police department. And then we kind of giggled about it, and he says, I kind of understand. You see, here's the thing. Have you ever stood with family members mourning the loss of a loved one? My experience is that, almost without fail, stories will start to arise as we stand around. Uh, Jack and Anna, we were at uh, Donna's memorial service this week, and I heard some stories that made me laugh. There were some family members that told stories. Even Jenny tried to tell a story, but it didn't all come out. Do you know the wonderful thing about that is? Those laughing stories are what helps us get through. And I can imagine that's what helped the women get through, not seeing Jesus and not seeing him until he revealed himself to Mary and said, Mary, why seek ye the living among the dead? She went, oh, wow! Could you imagine her joy at that moment? See, here's the thing. There were pictures, mementos, it, and I did two memorial services this week. Stories that were being told, and suddenly in the midst of it, there were, of the grief, there was, as, as I did uh, Linda Irvin's service on Friday, I was standing outside the room talking to the funeral director, and I was talking to the, one of the sons, and... We talked, and it was, it was a sad talk that we had. And he walked in, and somebody told him a story, and within two minutes of walking in the room, he was laughing. He said, you shouldn't do that at a funeral. Why not? Why not? Because the joy is that those folks are not there. They're with the Lord. They have a brand new body. Man, when I get mine, look out. Oh, I'll be able to bend over without any back pain. I'll be able to get up in the morning. All those things. But you see, laughter erupted in the midst of their tears. I watched Stephanie stand there and laugh while tears were running down her face. It had to have been joy of the great news of the resurrection that excited the women at the grave of Jesus that excites us today in the face of all that we're going through in this world, in the face of COVID and inflation and taxes and gas prices and food prices and lack of this and lack of that. Turn your, turn your vision to the empty tomb. Turn your focus to the resurrected Christ. And if that doesn't give you something to be excited about, I'm going to have to talk with you about that. You see, when laughter among, erupts among the tears, there's both a sad and a joyful experience all at the same time. How do you do that? It can only be God. It can only be God. See, it had to have been joy of the good news of the resurrection that spilled out and gave the women and the disciples the courage to speak the unfathomable truth that the one who was crucified is now alive. And I want to tell you, I, I realize that Easter and the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus is a serious thing, and I believe it's as serious as, as a heart attack, but I want to tell you something. It's enough to make you want to laugh, isn't it? That death thought it could hold Jesus in the tomb. That death thought it could hold Christ bound eternally in its grips. Don't you think when Christ came out of the grave that God let out a big guffaw and laughed in the face of the devil? In church, we are the sons and daughters of God. And the devil wants to scare you to death. 
God wants to get you to laugh to life. I know that sounds really strange, but you know it is. But you see, I want you to imagine something with me here for a moment. I want you to imagine the holy humor that God must have had when Christ came out of the tomb. I want you to imagine the smile on his face, even though he knew what was going to happen, that when the devil said, I don't know, uh, I don't know, have you ever heard uh, Isaac Garefrey? Did I ever give you that album? No? John's got it. But in there, there's, there's this thing where the devil tries, he tells all of his demons to hold Jesus. Don't let him get up. Hold him, hold him. Don't let him get out of the tomb. Do everything you can. Put another rock there. Don't let him out. And they're saying, we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can. And all of a sudden, up from the grave, he arose. And can't you imagine God just going, <laughs> and you little weaklings thought you could hold him in the grave who is me, who is resurrected, who cannot be held by chains of death. I just can imagine that. I can imagine Christ laughing at sin and evil in the world's attempts to control it. On resurrection morning, God, God declares that he will always have the last laugh. Think about that. God declares. When we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, or to those who want to call it Easter, when we celebrate that, it's God saying, no matter what happens, I will have the last laugh. It's good. <clears throat> you see, the greatest reversal ever, death back into life, the resurrection has been accomplished. It is worth some laughter, wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you guys be laughing today if you stood at that open tomb expecting to find in there the body of Jesus Christ and had him as the gardener come up to you and say, why seek ye the living among the dead? I say this at every memorial service. When we pass, we step into eternity. And I certainly hope that everybody is ready. Because, my friends, I want to tell you, eternity is a long time. But the greatest news is this. It's the bedrock of our faith. The hope for which we cling is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's the one thing I can just see God looking the devil square in the eye and going, ha ha, told you so. Now, I don't imagine God really doing that. No. Could be. Maybe it's a general resurrection, it'd be nice. You see, we, like the women at the tomb, like the disciples, like Thomas, whose story in John's gospel is typically read the Sunday after Easter, are caught between the tension of a story that is unbelievable and yet the one which is ground in our belief. It's unbelievable in the resurrection, is it not? Have any of you ever seen anyone resurrected? I have not. Other than in the spirit resurrected from death to life. I've never seen a bodily resurrection. But according to the book of Revelation, there's coming one. According to the book of Thessalonians, there's coming one. And that coming resurrection will be when all the dead in Christ shall rise and God will bring us forth with them, not to hinder them from coming. See, it's good and right that we should laugh at the very thought of defeating death. <clears throat> you say, well, all those who have gone on before us haven't defeated it. Oh, yes, they have. For to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. You see, God shows up with a chuckle and a nod that reminds us that with God, all things are possible. 
and we laugh again because it seems too good to be true, the news of the resurrection, the promise of eternal life, the unmerited grace. It overwhelms us with joy and laughter and deep, resounding laughter that ripples throughout our body and throughout all eternity because it started back at the grave, the tomb of Jesus. And today, we can declare he is not there. He is risen. So, this morning we laugh a little or a lot. I'm glad you laughed a little at my terrible jokes. In hopes of catching on to some divine joy, just a little bit, that fills the empty tomb. And to remind ourselves, even when things are difficult or seem impossible, that God is with us. And God is still laughing at our circumstances. Not at us. At what we're trepidating over, he is laughing about. He's laughing at the face of that which would otherwise bind us. He's laughing in the face of Satan who his one mission, as stated in John 10.10, 10, is but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus gives us life and gives it abundantly. You see, God is still laughing at that face. What good news of great joy indeed. I'm going to end with a joke. And I'd like to show it to you, but I didn't make it big enough for you to see it. But it's actually called Moses Lost in the Desert, Year 40. And it shows him zigzagging across the desert. And every time there's a zigzag, somebody hollers out, Recalculating! <laughs> and here's Moses at the head of the line saying, Shut up! Have you ever said that to your, your GPS or your Garmin or any of those things? I say it all. Every time that voice comes on and says, Recalculating. Oh, shut up. I know where I'm going. And then I expect that voice to say back to me, then why did you turn me on? Have you ever felt like that? Every time I hear that sweet, loving lady's voice say, recalculating, I want to scream. And how many men do you know will ever admit they're lost? We're just taking a sightseeing tour. Moses took a 40-year sightseeing tour, crisscrossing across 40 miles of desert for 40 years. And I can see God now. <laughs> Why'd you turn there? Why did you doubt me in the first place? Well, I guess. I guess. Once all that generation's gone, we'll have a new one to go into the promised land. Joshua took them into the promised land. And when they got in the promised land, they didn't want to go anyway because there was giants in that land. And David showed us how to defeat them with one simple stone. I was listening to a song coming in this morning, and it said, David, bring that giant down and until I looked at the title, I, I thought he was saying, David, call that fire down. And I'm thinking, David never called fire down. But David did bring down the giant. Remember what the giant said to him? Hey, come out here. We'll fight just you and me. And he says, okay, you come to me with a shield and a sword and all the armor that you have on. And I come to you in the name of the Lord. Can't you see? Goliath going, <laughs> you, me? The next thing we know, Goliath's dead and headless. Because God laughed. That little kid going against the giant. This little church in Plainfield, Illinois. Just a handful of people think they're going to make a mark on the world. We've already made it. We're going to make a bigger one. 
Now I can hear you out there doing exactly what Sarah did. <laughs> yeah, right. And the more that you laugh about it, the more God's going to bring it to pass. God is righteous. And God has never lied. We haven't been on this corner for 100 and plus years. Actually, in we, Plymouth, how many years? 65? 65 years. This building has been on this corner for 168 years or so. Is that right? I have to look to my historian. She knows more than I do. There's another one sitting there and another one sitting there. You know all about this church, don't you? But you see, God has a plan. And God laughs at us trying to fulfill our own plan. And then I hear these words. Recalculating. Recalculating. Get on the program. Start laughing a little. Enjoy your love with Jesus. Enjoy your life with him. And be like these ladies over here. You know what I call them? Anybody know what I call them? What is it? My smiling ladies. And before long, I'm going to have smiling ladies over here. And smiling ladies over here. And all you men are going to have to get with the program and start smiling once in a while. Because we take ourselves far too seriously. I'm going to leave you with one word. Recalculating. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and this hour and this time. And God, I thank you for your word. And our God, it did not quite go the way I expected. But Father, it's usually that way when you're in control. So God, today, may we submit to your calculations, not ours. And may we today find that funny bone and begin to enjoy the trip with you. God, we pray this all, that you receive our glory and honor. We pray together in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. Page 611, would you stand with me if you can? We'll sing, There is a Bomb in Gilead.
And if you today feel discouraged, just ask for God's help, and he will help you. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing of your spirit. And our God today, may the power of your word infuse us with joy unspeakable and full of glory. With the holy laughter, God, we know that a merry heart makes good like a medicine. And so God, laughter is one of those ways. Let us see the joy of your salvation in each of our hearts today. May you be blessed as we pray together in Christ's name and everyone.